And so if we're not careful, um, if we're not careful, our efforts to become more politically engaged might not actually solve the problems of our time, but instead contribute to further polarization and then, you know, further entrenchment and, and inaction. And I think this is why Obama's stated interest in empathy is so interesting to me. I, I wanna sort of pose this question of how we can be both, both more politically engaged and more empathetic, uh, which is not an easy thing. But I've, I've, uh, I've got a few uh, suggestions here that I'd like to uh, go over. One is, is the importance of just um, moving from theory to practice. Uh, secondly, to help students solve real problems, to focus on serving, and and uh, I'll explain what I mean by this. But don't 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 assume that you are trying to save the world, and I'll I'll talk a little bit more about that. So moving from theory to practice, I think, just simply means that we've got to do some translation of our own work in in uh, uh, into the public sphere. Translation requires empathetic listening. It means that we know the language of the audience, right? It means that we're familiar with the particular context and vocabulary in which we find ourselves. And public humanities is a wonderful way to do that. Um, I actually, almost the, the whole thing got started for me when I saw Utah Humanities Council had a fellowship for scholars who wanted to share their scholarship in the public. They gave us a modest stipend if we gave three lectures in non-academic venues. And I was writing a book about Derek Walcott and Walt Whitman and Pablo Neruda at the time. And I thought that would be an interesting challenge to see if I could make anyone care about it <laughs> outside of my students and my colleagues. And uh, it was exciting and challenging and uh, difficult, but it was rewarding. It helped me to reform um, some of my own thinking, actually, and some of my writing practices, my vocabulary, my tone. Um, I, I found that I was able to write with a clearer voice as a result. Um, I live in a particularly conservative and religious uh, uh, state and county, um, um, extraordinarily so, and I saw that I needed to engage a public that spoke a different language than I did, and I needed to learn how to do that kind of translation. I got involved in nonprofits. Um, uh, Utah Interfaith Power and Light was a state chapter of a national organization that is an interfaith uh, organization devoted to fighting climate change. And I rolled up my sleeves with Greek Orthodox, uh, with uh, Jewish communities, Catholic, Presbyterian, uh, Mormon, and others uh, to help fight climate change. And that too helped me to um, get outside of my ivory tower, uh, my academic world, and um, meet with and talk to and become friends with people who were locked ar in arms with me in a common cause, but who were not academics and didn't relate to my academic world at all. I th uh, it, it was extraordinary. We're gonna have a future um, workshop on letters to the editor and op-ed, so I won't say a whole lot more about that, but that's another important vehicle for finding your public voice. Uh, lobbying is something that's a very different kind of work than protesting uh, or, or sending an angry uh, letter to a senator or something like that. Lobbying uh, is, you know, sitting down in the office of a Congress uh, person or a senator and uh, sometimes uh, relegated to talking to a young staff member rather than the person you really want to talk to. But in a few cases, I've had the opportunity to speak directly to um, uh, my, my city and state leaders and uh, members of my congressional delegation. And I have found that to be both challenging and uh, uh, exciting. Um, and campaigns, of course, that's a partisan thing. Although in my city, city council is not a partisan uh, election. Thank goodness, I never would have been elected as a Democrat in my city, but I was able to uh, run and appeal to people. And of course, most campaigns, if they're worth their salt, know that they have to win over more than just the, the so-called base, right? That they have to learn how to speak a language that appeals across uh, constituencies. And um, I think that's 
good practice. I think it's important for us to learn how to be adept at uh, shifting tone, shifting vocabulary as we go door to door uh, and community to community. And I, I could go on and on, but I would say keeping it local is such a valuable thing. I mean, it's so discouraging to see what's happening nationally, but when you focus on your own city and your own community, uh, first of all, you have the opportunity to actually talk to live people, right? With names and faces with whom you can form relationships. And it's a lot harder to be cynical uh, uh, and, and sort of, you know, dismissive of, of a political problem when it's, it's sort of people you know, and you're working with them to try to figure things out. You know, we, we do a lot of teaching in the humanities to our students about how important it is to learn how to read a book closely. And I think reading our local community closely requires the same kind of skills of close reading. We can't make rash, quick judgments. I have had all kinds of stereotypes overturned in my head uh, about conservatives um, because of the fact that I've worked with some. Um, you know, I worked with a, a council member for two year, three years, who was, um, I later found out because he stepped down as a council member and we became friends on Facebook, which we hadn't been uh, while we were serving together. I later found out he was incredibly conservative. And if I was gonna judge him on his Facebook posts, I probably would have been disinclined to even talk with him. And yet we had accomplished a tremendous amount of good in the city. He had helped me uh, with affordable housing for the poor. He had helped me preserve agriculture in the city. I mean, it was extraordinary what we were able to do together. Um, and yet he was so different from me. Um, so I think if we, we just have to get the national lens sometimes a little bit off, uh, off the radar. Uh, finding common ground and common values. There's a lot of research on this in, in climate change research that we just simply can't move people if we are uh, using vocabulary that is polarizing or we are approaching the problem from an attitude of shaming people for having the wrong worldview. Uh, I think the real key to change in our culture is helping people to uh, appeal to their core values um, and help them see that their values have are sufficient and uh, adequate to respond to the problem. But when we tell them that their worldview is wrong, and I know there's some nuance there that we can talk about, but um, I, I think it's a beautiful thing when you can uh, strike that common ground with people. I will say, and this is uh, the fourth bullet point there, uh, it's no use, uh, there's no use in having conversations with people who are radicalized and who you know, simply have such strong convictions that they're coming at you guns a blazing. The, but the, the, real, the, the real secret is there is a sleeping majority. I mean, we've seen this in the Yale studies on climate communication that there's a, a very strong uh, portion of our population who are confused and movable. Uh, they, are in, they are capable of being influenced. If you appeal to their core values, they, they can change their minds. And I've seen it happen many, many times. I've had totally unproductive, unfruitful conversations with people, and I've gotten better at figuring out the difference. Um, but when we appeal to that sleeping majority of people who are just kind of inactive and uncommitted because they're confused, um, just avoid the mud fights, I guess is the point. Uh, and then finally, you know, there's an opportunity to research and uh, more about what you're doing as a result of civic engagement and write more about your experiences. Uh, we could talk more about that as well, but there's really a beautiful uh, kind of loop, uh, feedback loop that happens when you become more civically engaged in terms of what it does to your teaching, what it does to your research, what it does to how you feel about yourself as a professional academic. Um, helping students solve real problems. I think, uh, I, I know there's a, a good strong tradition of this among ASLE uh, uh, members. And so I, I won't say too much about this, but really you know, designing courses around real problems that students can wrap their minds around and try to solve is such an extraordinarily valuable thing. I think it's just so important to, again, sort of move away from theory and the abstract and move into the specific contextual actual situations where you and your students are humbled 
by the complexity of an actual problem. And you learn that you have to do this together and you learn that you have to do this with multiple resources and disciplines. I have a colleague at BYU who teaches an urban literature course and he decided to build it around uh, designing uh, neighborhood plans for the city of Provo uh, with the students. And so the students got concrete hands-on urban planning experiences, working with city planners, um, you know, moving in the class from theory into practice in some really interesting ways. And I just team taught a course with a biologist about the Provo River watershed. And we did something similar where we assigned uh, groups of students at the end of the semester to tackle one uh, major threat to the river's health, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that they were going to uh, address in a, in a specific way. Um, Focusing on service is just a good way to de-escalate tensions. Just uh, it's a positive move, right? You're offering your gifts as a speaker and a writer to a nonprofit or to the city or to the community in some way. You're offering public education. You're saying, I'm not just a teacher in a classroom uh, for students who pay tuition, but I am a teacher in my community. I am a, I, I, I take on the responsibility uh, of offering education to alumni, right? To uh, I've, I've done a number of podcasts for the public and radio interviews, and um, it's exhilarating and it's exciting because again, it, it challenges you to find that public voice, and and then you can see that you're you're gaining some traction, and uh, offer students as resources. I've been part of a number of nonprofits where. Nonprofits are just desperate all the time, right? They don't, they don't, they need always need somebody who has web experience, web design experience, and they always need students who can do all kinds of things. And students are actually itching for that opportunity. And if you can, it's it's even the best case scenario when you can create a formal internship for a student who gains really valuable experience for themselves while also helping uh, serve in the public. Um, uh, offering help for institutions uh, to live up to their potential. I think service is not an antagonistic approach. Uh, sometimes antagonism is what's called for, but I think sometimes institutions and politicians or other civic leaders have really good intentions and they're just failing to live up to them. And if they see someone offering help to live up uh, to their potential, then, then they may be more receptive. Um, and then I'll just uh, end on this, this point about saving the world. I, I do think um, the, our national situation and our climate situation, these are things that are just overwhelmingly difficult. And it's easy to become overwhelmed ourselves. It's easy to overwhelm our students. And it's part of the problem that we're faced with right now is that all of us can feel so overwhelmed that we become indifferent. And maybe you and I are not among the indifferent, but a lot of people are. And I think if we can help ourselves and others understand that just making a difference is better than saving the world um, as a motivation, because if you put yourself up for saving the world, and by that I mean, you know, any sort of major change that you can't sleep at night until you see, uh, you may never sleep. Uh, so there's, there's a, a value in seeing this as a process uh, one step at a time and making it a difference, moving in the right direction. I, I try to just keep myself focused on the fact that I can see change. It's slow, it's frustratingly slow, but at least it's moving in the right direction when, where and where I'm uh, engaged. And I, I think it's important to find renewal in the chance to be in your community and to be serving. Um, it does take more work, it can take more time, but I think it can be renewing and that's uh, deeply fulfilling. I'm generally of the persuasion that I'm, if I'm working a lot more hours at something I really enjoy, I hardly notice that I'm working harder. And, uh, but if I'm working at something that I find miserable, um, then obviously that's a different story. And, if, and like I say, if my goal is to save the world and I have not yet saved it, then that can be misery. But if my goal is to make a difference uh, and give myself more, more modest goals. Um, uh, I think it's important to wait until the right time in your career and in your life for more civic engagement. It's been a lot easier for me. My, my kids are grown um, and I you know, was long since tenured and so on. And so it's, it's, it, was a, it was a good time for me 
um, to do it, but it, it's also a long time process. It's not like tomorrow, if you decided to be more civically engaged, you'd suddenly find yourself in a sinkhole of time. Uh, it's incremental and, it, and it's a process. And I think you just have to decide to take, um, take certain steps in that direction and it builds over time. So find satisfaction in, in uh, the effort and uh, keeping your goals uh, modest and relish new relationships that you form. Um, I think there's just been nothing better than the opportunity to, as a, as a scholar and as an academic, knowing that I have good friends in the community. I know my mayor, I know, my, um, I know some of my state legislators, I know uh, civic leaders, I know heads of nonprofits, and they can call on me for help and I can call on them for help. And that's a, that's a really powerful thing. The bottom line is that solving problems is really, really hard work. And I think the one thing I've learned in my civic engagement is that I was a bit of an armchair critic. And that's not to say that my criticisms weren't fair entirely or that they were unjustified, but they were not uh, maybe uh, shaped by or influenced by the reality of how complex and some, difficult some problems are. And I think it's good to roll up your sleeves and say, I'm going to try to be part of the problem solving process rather than just offering myself as a critic, which is what we are by profession, right? Um, <clears throat> but I think I've learned, it's humbled me quite a bit and it's helped me uh, uh, to sort of, you know, reshape some of my own uh, critical work. So um, <clears throat> I, uh, that, that's, that's a, uh, the extent of what I wanted to share with you. I was going to put this question in um, in the uh, chat. Um, I don't know if there, I, sorry, I haven't had a chance to see if there are any questions from the chat. Are there any questions there? There were two questions in the chat, George. Uh, okay. Um, one more pragmatic in nature about whether slides might be shared with participants. Of course, this seminar is being recorded. Um, and then a wonderful question from Kimberly Richards at the top. Kimberly, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? It's a great question. Hi, sure, sure. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I really appreciate a lot of what you've been saying. And um, I think there's, a, you know, the kind of status of precarity for a lot of um, recent graduates means that sometimes we're moving across institution cities, things like that, um, more quickly than might be ideal for uh, doing the kind of deep local work and um, working in tandem with uh, organizations and whatnot that uh, in our communities that would otherwise kind of, con you know, be productive alongside our, our research and writing and everything we're doing on campuses. So I was just wondering if you could speak to um, people who are maybe at an earlier point of their career before tenure where maybe um, they're, they're not yet as established in one community. Yeah. Yeah. Super, super important question. Um, uh, it's hard to speak to everyone's circumstance, obviously, uh, and there are going to be limits, right, to how locally you can be engaged when when you're moving frequently. Um, I mean, it, I do think, though, that uh, a, a good ethos to the degree that it's possible that we all have to adopt is, um, and I, I just learned this years ago from, you know, reading about a sense of place and a lot of the environmental writers that we love so much, just that um, I'm going to be, I, I have had the, the, the fortune of being able to stay put now for 22 years in, in one city, but, but I didn't know that I had that luxury when I started. Um, you know, like a lot of people, I applied for jobs uh, for a couple of years and, you know, got a job at a place I didn't like uh, or didn't think I liked. I now kind of wonder if I would, would have been very, I probably would have been very happy there, but um, but the 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 movement of academics is is a real problem, and and it's it's a problem that's not unique to us. Of course, <clears throat> it's uh, a problem in our economy, 
And I, I try to tell my students, you know, you're only here in this town for a little while and you don't think you belong here. You don't think this is your community, but guess what it is. And decisions are being made right now that affect your life. Um, so I think it's a little bit like, I mean, when I moved to Flagstaff, Arizona for my first job, um, <clears throat> I, that was kind of my environmental awakening. And I had friends who knew like every wildflower and every nook on the, tr every corner of every trail. And I, I really admired that. And I, and I sort of decided that, that I, even if I was only going to be there for a while or wherever I was going to be, I needed to try to like sort of make myself local as quickly as possible. So I do think, I, I mean, I would only say just like, you know, being in the habit of orienting yourself to where you are, even if you don't know how long that's going to be, is just a good habit to be in. And then hopefully, uh, you know, you start establishing networks and uh, get an opportunity to be uh, more placed so that you can you can do that kind of work. But I, I, you know, I've known people who've come and gone in this community in very brief periods who've still made a significant difference. Um, and I live in a place where people are, you know, if you haven't lived here for 25 years, you don't really belong yet kind of place, you know? Uh, I'm, I'm on my 22nd year and I'm still, I'm still fighting the impression that I'm an outsider who ran for city council. Um, but <clears throat> I, think, I think that just the sort of declaration that I'm a citizen, I'm here, I, I care enough to be here um, is, is, is a good place to start. I know that's not the, the, the most satisfying answer, but I think, I think it's just good to have the sort of local state of mind, uh, even when you're not, uh, able to be, uh, in one place for a long period of time. It's, it's a good portable kind of citizenship, if that makes sense. I see Kenneth has a question. Sure. George, I just oh. wanted to ask if you wanted to take another question before we go into breakout rooms. There is a queue. Um, maybe take Kenneth's question and, and then the breakout rooms or what, whatever you like. Yeah, why don't we, why don't, let me just look at the uh, chat box. Yeah, Kenneth, go ahead and I'll, I'll look at this other question. And Okay, thank you uh, for a very uh, enriching talk, uh, George. Uh, personally, I like the kind of work that you are doing uh, with uh, Scott Slovic and uh, other scholars in this field, uh, uh, combining academic work and uh, this public engagement. And, and that's a path that I want to follow and that I've been planning to do. So even before I came in contact with uh, environmental humanities, so I had political plans for, at a more personal level, but now I'm combining them with the realities that I'm coming across through the work uh, I'm doing. Now, my question to you is this, is often very easy uh, to, uh, to, as a, an armchair critic, I, whether scholarly one or political one, to criticize those who have the power. Uh, but now that you've saved uh, at the city council, yes, of course, you said your council is not very partisan. <clears throat> I wanted to ask, how do you juggle or how do you deal with criticism, like the kind of criticism that some other people might label on you uh, because of some policy you voted or some decisions you've taken uh, within your capacity now as a city uh, elected official? And how do you balance that now with your own work uh, as, an, uh, as a scholar? And maybe some of the implicit or explicit criticisms of other scholars that might be aimed at you or some people in, sim in similar situations. Thank you, uh, Kenneth. It's good to see you. Um, and and uh, that's a great question. I, I think that um, I, I mean, I was accused of being a, a wolf in sheep's clothing when I ran uh, because it was a nonpartisan election, but people found out I was a Democrat and they got kind of panicky and the Republicans in the neighborhood, uh, the district that I live in, were organized against me and saying that you know he's really dangerous for the city. Um, and in some ways, that kind of backfired on them because I was meeting in people's homes, I was having cottage meetings and talking to people, and they were they were pretty vicious about it. And and um, I just said, look, this is this is not what this is exactly why I'm running. I can't stand this culture of of political fighting that you're doing right now, you know, and I, I kind of called them out on it and said, this is not what I stand for. And I will represent people who are conservative. I'm not going to only listen to people who are liberal. And I kept saying there's not a liberal or conservative way to fix a pothole. And so, you know, you can't assume that national politics are always the thing that determines how you're going to handle 
uh, a city, you know? So I just tried to keep my focus on my, on my character and my relationships and my values. And I just kept stating what my values were during the mask mandate problem. It got, it, I mean, like I say, there were, there were a, a group of people that I couldn't, I couldn't reason with, and they were threatening some of them to me. Um, but in one case, I had a former politician who wrote me a five, uh, no, it was a 12 page single space letter about why I was a socialist because I believed in masks. And it was just, it was just unbelievable. And I, and I it was exhausting to have to engage with that. I don't think I persuaded him a whole lot, except that I, he was making it a little bit public and I just, I defended myself. Um, and again, I was just trying to say, I am, this is not about partisanship. And I've said that about climate change <clears throat> since I was elected. And I was able to persuade a number of conservatives that, that this was something that they should care about too. Um, so I think you have to be really careful to just, uh, I've had to, I've taken up meditation. <laughs> I, I, I have needed therapy a few times. I mean, you know, I, it's not easy, but I've had to, I've had to try to stay as firmly committed to civility as I could and just keep my cool. And when other people blow up, let them make that look that make that look, make, let that make them look bad rather than, you know, you. contaminate me. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. You bet. Um, maybe, maybe we should go to our, our break then uh, for a, the, a question. And the question I, I want you to think about, I've pu put here in the chat so that it'll be available to you is what are the next steps you can take to make your professional and personal lives more focused on solving contemporary and local problems? And we're gonna break you into, I guess, groups of four or five, I guess. Is that right, Bethany? Um, um, Amy's the, the breakout room uh, okay. maven. So she's gonna- There will be, there will be four or five that. people in each breakout room. Okay. And so we'll take about five or six minutes on this and then and then we'll come back and there are more questions and, and you may have some more thoughts after you've had this, uh, uh, had this conversation with one another. But I'd like it to be self-reflective just to thinking about, you know, what, what could be your next steps that you think you'd like to take? He's back. Thank you for uh, for taking a moment there. Um, there is one more question here from Lisa Fink that I thought I, I would try to answer, and then I'd like to uh, ask you just ad hoc uh, for anyone who wants to share some thoughts that you had uh, in your from from your discussion or any questions that might have arisen. Lisa asks. Uh, do I have any suggestions or stories about how some of this work can be done in collaboration with others rather than solo, whether it is writing letters to the editor, lobbying, or developing campaigns? Um, I, I think actually they're all uh, collaborative. I don't think any of those should, you should think of those as, as uh, things you have to do in a vacuum. And frankly, it's only in uh, collaboration with others that I ever found the courage to do any of those things. So, uh, so it was, um, I mean, I guess I could say it started very simply uh, for me when I moved here, there was a rendering plant that had a very bad odor in the air. And I went to my first city council meeting to voice my concern about this. And um, but because I moved to a very religious community and I decided to start writing about, for, as a scholar, writing about religion and the environment, um, I decided to try uh, an op-ed. And so I wrote an op-ed um, for one of the state's uh, major papers, the Deseret News. And um, and then I started getting uh, uh, invitations. Uh, there was a sort of thirst in this state for uh, someone who could speak the language of the Mormon faith and a tradition, but it directed toward environmental concern. And so I started getting um, solicited all over the place to, to be that kind of uh, 
uh, advisor to different organizations. Um, uh, and I ended up writing, co co-authoring an op-ed for the Deseret News with Mitch Hescox, who's the head, head of the environment, Evangelical Environmental Network. Um, and I co-authored another uh, op-ed with a um, conservative Christian politician uh, who runs a think tank for the environment in DC. I didn't know these people existed, but they were like coming out of the woodwork to, um, uh, it's just been a, I, I, it's kind of a long story to explain, but I think it, it's like a snowball effect that you just start getting involved. And with time, you start making connections and people um, hear about you. But I think at first it took, uh, uh, a few um, steps of my own and then some invitations. And then I just saw everything that I was getting uh, opened up to as opportunities. Being a part of a nonprofit's uh, definitely been uh, the best formal way for me to, to be engaged because they're, they're the groups that do some of the lobbying and, and they do campaigns for writing letters and they do um, do figure out how to work with other organizations and uh, that that really helps to feel like I'm I'm not alone I'm doing this with other people so what we're in, in light of that uh, brief uh, description of, of uh, some steps that I took or, or what, what kinds of thoughts came to your minds uh, about steps you could take anyone want to share thoughts that you had in your in your breakout discussion And uh, Anne raises an uh, uh, Anne raises an interesting issue, and that is there's no local journalism left. Uh, I did blogging for three years. I don't know if blogging is still kind of like a viable thing anymore. I don't I, I don't know, but I, I tried that for uh, a while, and it was uh, um, it was really exhilarating. It was totally draining. I mean, I had to stop because it was like consuming my every waking hour, but. Um, uh, that was one way in which I also sort of practiced my public voice and I started to see that, you know, occasionally a post would get some traction and, and uh, I would, I would figure those things out. Bethany, do you, is there somebody who has a question? Uh, I actually wanted to just share briefly from our group and invite um, Mohammed, if he cares to, to contribute his thoughts. Our group um, had mem uh, had members who were Zooming from Philadelphia, in my case, from Sierra Nevadas, from Indonesia, from Nigeria, and from Bangladesh. Uh, so we took some time to think about how in thinking through next steps, we would also need to contextualize your wonderful tips for the very local situations that we found ourselves in. Um, and we had some different, we had got going, but um, Mohammed, I don't know if you wanted to share what your thoughts on that? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so this is uh, Hassan from Bangladesh. And uh, it was, uh, I mean, really a great experience for me to uh, be able to attend this session. So uh, I don't really have any question. I, I would just like to share my experience of uh, sort of doing or studying a little about eco-criticism and environmental humanities. So in, in the uh, universities of Bangladesh, mainly in the English departments, uh, there is no such thing or, or no such courses as eco-criticism or environmental humanities. Uh, but uh, some of the teachers have just started taking up uh, this subject. And we, at my university, I have proposed to revise the syllabus and include some courses that addresses these issues. So uh, it's not yet cemented in our academic world in Bangladesh, that's what I can say. But that is ironic because Bangladesh one, is one of the most vulnerable countries to the uh, I mean, cataclysmic changes. So I hope that it's going to be a I mean, huge challenge for us like uh, academics from Bangladesh to uh, make sure that these uh, pertinent issues are properly addressed and taken into consideration in the, in the academic world so that we can also uh, collaborate with the sort of uh, policy makers and make some meaningful changes. So, but it's, it's going to be a big and, and a very tough task for all of us. 
because uh, there is there is a big gap communication gap between the academicians and and the politicians so i mean it's it's a really challenging thing for all of us from here that's that's what i i just wanted to share thank you very much thank you so much hassan and um i, I i'm so impressed with the diversity of uh, and international participation in this event i think that's really fabulous and i you know i i i know that a lot of us have wanted ASLI to become more international and have been working on that for a long time. And I think it's increasing, but I, I do think it's, um, even in the States, uh, it's very common for eco-critics to feel uh, alone. <laughs> you know, uh, I, was, I was the only eco-critic at my university for, uh, for quite a long time before we hired uh, one other. <laughs> and so, and I have a huge, I'm at a huge university. So I, I, I think it's important for all of us to just carry that um, responsibility with, with courage and, um, and conviction. So more power to you. I, and I don't think, um, you know, as far as uh, civic engagement goes, um, I think, again, you all have to, we all have to make our decision about what, you know, how fast can I run and how much can I carry before I feel crushed by the weight of responsibilities. But um, to the degree that you feel like you can, um, you know, use what you know uh, for the good of your society and your community. Um, uh, you you uh, you may have to do some of that alone. Um, even though I was just talking about having you know the the benefit of having other people uh, encourage you. But anyway, I, I I'm I'm not being very helpful except to say I encourage you, and uh, from a distance, uh, I think it's so important that you're there and you're doing what you're doing. So. Um, keep it up. And it, it's just wonderful to see so many people here from uh, so many different places. Um, Lisa, you do you have a question? Well, I was just going to share from our breakout room um, a couple of things we talked about that weren't brought up earlier. Um, first of all, thank you for your talk because I got so many good ideas about things that I might do next. I live in Portland, Oregon. I, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Oregon and I'm very involved in the housing justice work going on in Portland, Oregon. And one of the things that um, I see a lot in the groups doing work in my area are public education campaigns on social media. Um, and so, and I think that could be really helpful. So that was one of the things we had talked about briefly was creating public education campaigns um, on various issues specifically for social media. Um, and then I was also thinking about, let's see, there were two other things, but one is I'm only remembering one other one. We were talking about thinking about civic engagement beyond the role of the citizen I was really struck by that in the quotation, I think from Obama, he was really thinking of it, you know, in the role of the citizen. And uh, in our group, there were only two of us, myself and um, someone from Italy. And we um, were just trying to think kind of beyond that role of the citizen as perhaps people who dwell and work and live and play in the same place. I don't know if you maybe want to comment on that or not either way. Um, tell me a little bit more about that, what you mean by beyond, beyond citizenship or beyond the citizen. Well, I think we're thinking about how, you know, we live alongside many people who are not citizens I see. in our community. That's, that's how we were thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, those are two really valuable insights. Yeah. I, I, um, uh, I mean, with regard to the social media, I think, uh, and I probably should have said that along with blogging, but yeah, I think there's there's lots of other ways to, in fact, every every effort I've ever been a part of has in, had to involve social media and and I'm no good at it. So I'm not, I'm not a good person to actually give concrete tips on that, but I, I've just, I just know that it's uh, vitally important and um, and can be really powerful when it's used well. Um, the, the issue, uh, uh, of, of those who are not citizens is, uh, is a really challenging one. Um, I don't really have any good answers to that. I mean, I can just say from a political point of view, for example, in 
my city, there are a lot of uh, Latinx uh, people who um, are not not legal citizens or not not uh, citizens and and are not they're disempowered. They don't have a voice in the community. I am a fluent Spanish speaker, and I've been trying to do like videos in Spanish and outreach in Spanish to try to encourage people to feel like they have a voice with me. They have a, a line of communication open to me. Um, but it's been extremely difficult because they they don't they don't want to be you know out of fear, especially over the last four years, they've just not wanted to risk putting themselves in, in, in a position of, uh, of risk. And so um, it's been really challenging. Um, but I think that's maybe, you know, the translation that I was talking about was maybe uh, uh, sounding like I was only talking about metaphorical translation, but I think actually in a lot of cases, we need, we are talking about the need for that literal translation. And in fact, one thing I've, uh, been conscripted to do. I'm part of a Hispanic roundtable that's in our city, and, and we've been just sort of conspiring to figure out how to solve some of these issues, especially with COVID, because this population is getting really hit uh, hard, uh, is we've got a university where we've got students getting degrees in interpretation and translation. We've got some of the best ling linguistic capacities at my university of, of, of almost any university in the country. And they're they're not they're not tapped into this local community, and so that's something that I'm I'm going to be trying to uh, figure out how to use those resources again to offer students maybe as a as a way of, of bridging the linguistic gaps and hopefully build more understanding and more communication. Uh, we're at the hour, um, so I think that doesn't mean anything necessarily, except that if you need to go, uh, and of course this was true all along, if you needed to go, no one was going to be offended. <laughs> so, uh, but I think we're here for another 15 minutes or so if, if you want to keep going. Uh, any other thoughts or questions that came up? I'd be curious to know uh, what you think are um, some of the challenges with making your specific areas of research relevant to your community um, and, and what kinds of successes or, or struggles have you had in, in doing that if, you, if you've tried that. Go ahead, um, Ann. Okay, uh, can I? Yes, uh, in answering that question, uh, I will be referring to part of what I discussed in our breakout room. Uh, the, the, this experiment that I did uh, last semester when I was teaching, because I taught two courses, I'm a PhD student at the moment, and I, I taught two courses last semester in Aarhus University. And one of them was in the Department of Comparative Literature. Well, yes, I, I can say, uh, the local aspect is not very much present. If I am to say that, okay, my PhD is on the Congo Basin, which is in Africa, and that I was experimenting with Danish students in Denmark. <laughs> well, but the good thing is that at least I combined uh, classical literary studies with creative writing in one course. So uh, I introduced the students, many of whom had not heard about eco-criticism before the class. Uh, a greater majority hadn't heard about eco-criticism and environmental humanities before that course. So they, I, they got introduced to the concepts and the theory. We read a theoretical texts and we, we tried to analyze some uh, uh, literature, uh, drama, poetry, and, and excerpts from novels because I wanted to expose them to a good number of writers from Africa, like Ken Sarawiwa and, and the others from the Congo Basin. But then we also workshopped so that when their interest was already stimulated on these environmental issues and climate change issues, uh, we had now to do a workshop where they would either pick up a, a relevant environmental problem in Denmark or elsewhere and write about. So some of them wrote very beautiful short stories, some wrote poems, and I think about one or two of them even wrote, though they have not been to Africa, but they actually set their stories in Africa in a kind of a response to the problems that had been raised as environmental problems in the Congo Basin uh, to them in the, in the course. And I think that kind of experiment would even be much more fruitful or 
helpful if I should say, if it were done in a university, say in Cameroon or in Congo Brazzaville or Gabon, which are countries of the basin, uh, if I'm going to, yeah, to talk about the local aspect, which we mentioned now. So, uh, and again, it, con it connects with what you were saying that isolators should have been more present by now in much of the world, but it is still absent in some places. And I think one of those places is Africa, uh, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. So and I think we have to think about what can be done in that direction and to, and to also be able to carry out this kind of experimentation where we, we, we make students not only aware of the lenses through which we can look at environmental problems from the humanities perspective, but also what they can do practically on the field at their own levels to make a difference. Yeah, I, thank you, Kenneth. That's uh, I, I, I've I've had that same kind of experience. I'm sure many of us have had that. Uh, I, and it's probably one of the main reasons why I got into environmental humanities and have stuck with it is that the students are so responsive to it, and and they and they, but they want to do something. Like they they are not content with just learning, right? And and I learned that very early on. There was almost the, the first environmental humanities class I ever taught. They were practically demanding that we do a service project or come up with, they just couldn't stand not having um, a, a plan for, uh, of action. Um, and and one other thought that comes to mind in your comments that I I might be relevant to to this discussion is that I, I was trained in post colonial literature Caribbean literature and Latin American literature and um, I found that as I was teaching a lot of those books in Provo Utah which is just a you know completely different culture uh, than than what um, the, the, than the one that's represented in the books they're reading that they needed some local, they needed some local literature as well. Like, so even if the class was um, about the conditions of post-slavery uh, society in, in the Caribbean uh, or something like that and, and, and the environmental issues there, um, I found that I needed, I needed them, it, it helped them to feel empowered if I could connect the material of that class more locally in some way, and that maybe that was through some sort of project or it was through some sort of reading that would orient what they had learned from the other literature that we'd been reading to their particular context. I mean, some of you live in uh, more diverse places than I do, so it's, it, it, it's not that hard, you know, if you were to be teaching uh, Caribbean literature in New York City to turn to your immediate environment and, and, and uh, you know, find some applicability. But for me, it was a, it's been a struggle. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I'm just hearing, you know, Denmark and Africa is probably a, a comparable uh, 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 gulf of, of different cultural difference that I think it's helpful to get, get some sort of traction on the, on the local uh, with local materials. Uh, I've got a question here from Bill. Any insight into how today's mainstream conservatism seems to hate nature, to delight in cruelty and destruction? Is it inexperience, resentment about limits on oil use? Is there a love inside a sleeping majority? Um, absolutely, uh, there is. And absolutely, I, I mean, this is the weird thing. I mean, I know that this is going to sound strange to say, but, and I'm just basing this on my experience here, And I, but but I have... I have yet to meet someone who actually does hate nature and I've yet to see someone who can't respond. Uh, if I ask them, uh, and this is actually where you can find that common ground pretty quickly. Uh, sometimes that common ground doesn't solve the problem. I'll be clear about that, but, but it does actually deescalate the conversation in some important ways. We did an experiment uh, a number of years ago Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're a very active organization in Utah um, protecting uh, wildlands. And they decided to host a series of faith-based conversations about wilderness. And they they simply went into different faith communities throughout Utah. And they and we did this through you know connections of people we knew and so on. And we hosted, I hosted a conversation here in Provo with a bunch of Mormons and we just said, okay, why do you love wilderness? And it wasn't about like, what do you think of the Sierra Club or what do you think of Bureau of Land Management? Because if you drop those bombs in a conversation in Utah, that's not gonna get, get you very far. But if you say, what do you like about nature or what were your early experiences as a child? I mean, Utah has a tremendous legacy and heritage of, of 
environment of the environment. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. And anyone who's ever spent any time here knows that and they have experienced it. They have views that don't necessarily line up with that. But what, what was fascinating was that when we asked that question about what uh, nature had meant to them, they were people just like practically like having emotional, spiritual experiences, uh, weeping while they're talking about what it meant for them as a young child to go into the uh, red rock country of Southern Utah when they were young and that this had formed their bonds of affection with their family and their community. And I ended up having a conversation with a state legislator at one point, who's one of the most conservative members of the state legislature about, uh, about his, he owns a ranch down in Southern Utah. And he, he said to me, if you came to my property, you would see that I love nature and that I am a good steward of my land. And I said, I, I don't doubt that that's true. Um, I said, I have a hard time squaring that with the fact that you just led a protest up Pariah Canyon with ATVs and guns. <laughs> and destroyed that canyon in the process. Um, and, and I appealed to Boy Scouts because he had been a Boy Scout. And I said, I learned when I was a Boy Scout that you're supposed to leave no trace and you left lots of traces. And he actually, he didn't, he didn't argue the point with me. Uh, he, he kind of acknowledged that I was, I was right on that particular point. But the, the main issue is that it was clear that, that if I was gonna have any further conversation with him, I mean, he, he's from another part of the state and I haven't had much interaction, but I needed to understand what his relationship to the land was. And that there was, uh, again, I, the sleeping majority is definitely the way to go though. I mean, I just think that there's some people who are locked in on uh, this sort of ideological hatred and it's not hatred of nature, it's hatred of liberals. It's hatred of regulation. It's hatred of big government that they don't trust. But that in Utah anyway, the reason they don't trust those things is because they love the land so much. And, they're, and those things are the things that get in their way of loving the land. I know that sounds really contradictory, but that's, but see, I, I didn't understand any of that complexity until I actually started talking to people. Um, and, and, you know, I've had this dream that maybe I could get an army of students who go out and do interviews with all of those people who are so angry at the Bureau of Land Management and angry at the government and see if we can't figure out how to solve that problem because it's not going away. It just keeps getting worse. Um, so anyway, that's a, that's a oh, good that really important Thanks, question. George. What's that? That helps a lot. I really appreciate that that response. That gives me a lot to to work with. I mean, I'd rather I'd rather somebody convince me that they actually do hate nature than than to assume that they do, right? I mean, I think that's that's you just sort of have to start with the assumption that clearly, you know, you and I have had similar kinds of experiences. It's impossible living where we do to not have a love for the mountains, a love for the rivers, you know, and maybe you like to wander. I, I, I remember having this very jarring moment when I was uh, new to the American West where I uh, listened to a man weep openly about how much he loved his, uh, loved uh, the, the natural world while he was hunting deer. And, and I, I thought that was weird and I didn't understand it. I was like, but you were there to kill it. I don't, you know, <laughs> but then I was like, well, okay. At the time I was more of a meat eater than I am now. And I thought, well, why am I, why am I any, any different? Uh, I don't know. Anyway, I, I, but I think it's, it's powerful to appeal to, to people's, uh, uh, to, to appeal to people's love of nature. Cause that is almost universal. I'm just reading uh, Jennifer's point. My urban students often have little or no experience with nature. They don't hate nature, but haven't been moved by it. The polarization seems rather about liberal versus conservative. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's just the great uh, uh, illness of our time. I just, I just, it's so disheartening. I'm sure we could spend lots more time talking about that, but it's, I think that's really, that's why I say, I just, I think it's worth trying things that you, um, that maybe are less polarizing. I, I will say this, there's a tendency that I feel in my own conscience that I'm sure many of you feel that if, I, if, I, if I'm too much of the peacemaker and I'm too much of the common ground person, I'm actually just appeasing stuff that is wrong. And I should just call it for what it is and, and just walk away or you know torch the ground or whatever. 
And I, I don't, I don't pretend that I haven't worried myself. Uh, I've worried myself about that a lot. I, I don't necessarily know. Sometimes I think I'm, I've, I've over, I've over um, developed my skills of diplomacy to the point where I, I, I can, I, I'm not as clear and as blunt as sometimes I need to be. All I can say is that because I have learned those skills, that people trust me, they talk to me, I hear more than I otherwise was hearing. And, and, I, and I, ha I can point to victories. I can point to people whose hearts have been changed, whose minds have been changed, who are in positions of power and that that has mattered. One of them, I won't say I'm the only person, but one of them is our current Congressman, John Curtis. He was my mayor and we convinced him to create a sustainability committee in Provo. And he was like, he was like, oh, you mean like in Boy Scouts leave no trace? I'm not kidding. And it was like, yeah, that's what we mean. And he's like, okay. Um, and so that's what we did. And then for eight years, we just kept bugging him about this, that, and the other air quality, recycling, energy, you name it. And for the longest time, he wouldn't talk about climate change. He was resistant to it, but we just kept giving him stuff to read. We kept talking to him, working with him, treating him like a, a decent person who meant well. And he ran for Congress and he ran for Congress in an extraordinarily conservative district and beat out uh, Jason Chaffetz or replaced Jason Chaffetz. And uh, he is the first Republican uh, congressional delegation member in Utah to ever talk about climate change. And he's now part of this uh, climate, um, uh, I don't know whether climate caucus or something that's working with conservatives. So, uh, you know, there, there, there are opportunities there that just, it's just unfortunate that we don't have that many years left. And so if it's gonna take eight years to convince a, con uh, anyway, so I'm glad other people are doing more radical things. I just don't think that's my, that's my skill set. All right, well, we're, we're almost out of time. If there's no more questions, this has been lovely and I really appreciate all of your uh, being a part of it and thank you to uh, please join me uh, in thanking George George what a terrific workshop I learned such a such a huge amount and I think you're hearing from requests for slides and the recording uh, just how powerful your words and example have been so really thank you and thanks to all of you for joining us there is another Astley workshop on public engagement coming up you might have seen that in the chat please do register tell your friends and if you have ideas or proposals for future public engagement uh, workshops that you'd like to see, please don't hesitate to be in touch. Thanks again for being here. And thanks especially to you, George. Thank you. Thank you all. It's wonderful to see you all. Be well, be safe. <laughs> Stay safe. Thanks, George. <laughs>